Morning, everyone. My name is Matthew Forniseri, but most folks just call me Forney. I am the CTO and co-founder of Gremlin, which offers a robust enterprise chaos engineering platform. And over the past four and a half years, we've helped countless customers mature their operational practices by introducing a little chaos into them. And oddly enough, that's why I'm here today to talk to you. So prior to starting Gremlin, I worked at Salesforce and before that at Amazon.com, really focusing on increasing the reliability of these immensely complex systems. So before we dive in, I wanna take you all back in time to a moment that really shaped the path of my career. This uh, Death Star you see on the screen in front of you uh, is a Death Star of microservices that made up the Amazon retail website about eight and a half years ago. And this exact image was pulled up on my monitor as I sat at my desk in the Amazon HQ in Seattle, Washington. Now on my other monitor was a blinking cursor and a blank email that I was absolutely agonizing over. And the email was addressed to Jeff Bezos, or Uncle Jeff as we called him at the time. And what I had to do was take the latest Amazon.com outage and distill it down to just a few sentences. And then what he'd do is respond with a smiley face, a sad face, or the worst, a question mark. And believe me, you don't wanna get a question mark. That's no good. See, at the time, my job was to investigate what went wrong during outages. But more importantly, my job was to make sure that they never happened again. I worked on a team called Platform Excellence, which was a modern day precursor to the SREs. Uh, and we actually monitored all of Amazon retail website from 2010 to 2013. And this was at the tail end of a huge digital transformation from Monolith to that Death Star. And with this migration came a whole new frontier of failures that we had never, ever seen before. And admittedly, this was a little frustrating for a new college grad. So one day in a one-on-one -on -one with my director, I'm just venting, telling him about all the things that are going wrong and how we could do better here, better here. And I'll just never forget how he responded. He took a deep breath and he leaned back in his chair and he just looked me in the eyes and said, Forney, it sounds a lot like this is happening to you and you need to be happening to it. As much as I kind of hated hearing him say that at the time, he was absolutely right. We were never gonna get ahead by sitting back on our haunches and waiting for issues to occur. We needed to go on the offensive and proactively poke and prod our system to suss out issues before customers were affected. And why I like this is it ties really nicely into how I like to think about the spectrum of operational maturity. See, on the left side, We've got these organizations that are at the beginning of their journey. They really just want to understand the ramifications of incidents. And don't get me wrong, this is a critical first step in the evolution of responsible operations, but it just doesn't inspire a lot of urgency. Then you've got organizations that are a little further along in their maturity that are focused on the effectiveness of their response during a crisis. And this is a huge leap forward in becoming operationally mature. It really addresses that sense of urgency but it's still all about being reactive. Then there are organizations that are cut from the same cloth as myself. They think about maturity as creating an environment that encourages proactive experimentation. And this ends up rooting out issues before they occur, making for a culture where incidents are the exception, not the rule. But every organization has to start somewhere, right? So for the purpose of this talk, let's pretend we're a new organization or a new team. and We're just starting our journey to operational maturity. One of the questions I hear most often is, where should we even start? Well, you start with understanding your system so that you can identify and react to issues as they arise. Some folks like to call this firefighting, but I call it table stakes. And the best way to understand, understand your system is really to measure it. After all, you can't act on something that you don't know is happening. And that's where observability really comes into play. Having insight into the operations of your services and systems are the foundation on the road to reliability. But with an endless stream of metrics that you could analyze to try to deduce the health of your system, how do you really distinguish the signal from the noise? Well, Google laid out four golden signals in their SRE handbook aimed at doing just that. They are traffic, saturation, latency, and errors. But if you look closely at these four, one of them is not quite like the others. Traffic is really a measure of demand and how much load is currently being placed on your system. And as such, it's more of an input to our system and it's largely out of our control. 
And sure, you can run marketing campaigns and drive traffic, but for all intents and purposes, all the traffic that you get is not something you directly control. But the three remaining signals, they're the output metrics of your system. And they really paint the picture of how your system ends up handling that traffic. So saturation represents how much of your system is currently being utilized. It serves as an early indicator when the traffic is exceeding the allocated resources. And it signals that it's time to scale up or down for that matter, based on resource utilization. After all, it's all about right sizing your infrastructure. Latency then measures how long it takes for you to provide a meaningful experience to your customers. And that's gonna be different for different companies. At Amazon, we measured the 95th percentile of the time to load the page above the fold, which it's a mouthful, but that's what we took a look at in order to tell whether we were providing a good experience. And that matters so much because a slow experience is almost as bad, if not worse, than a request failing fast with a good error message these days. Nobody likes that spinner that just sits there and doesn't do anything, right? And that brings us to our final metric, errors. Now, full disclosure, I worked on the Fatals team at Amazon after Platform Excellence, so I'm a little biased when it comes to these signals. I think this is one of the most important ones, but ideally all are created equal. It should be painfully obvious here, though, why this is an important metric to keep an eye on, and that's because it literally translates to how many customers you cause pain to. Every customer that shows up in an error is somebody that didn't have a good experience. And anytime this baseline error rate starts to increase, there's likely something going on in your system that you should be paying attention to. So these three golden metrics are an incredible high level representation of your system's resilience to the traffic being thrown at it. Now, once we have, we were able to observe the health of our system, not only can we start to identify what went wrong, but we can engage and mitigate the issues. This means that having a process in place for handling incidents when they inevitably arise. And this is a huge next step in the actual maturity of, an opera of operations. So at Gremlin, we have something called a call leader. I'm sure you all have something very similar, but they'll spin up a Zoom call, a Slack room, they'll engage the right people, and they'll run the incident until it's resolved. And this really allows us to mitigate customer pain as quickly as possible and helps us understand what went wrong in real time instead of in the post-mortem. So when the issues resolve, everyone involved gets onto a call and when they perform a blameless retrospective. The goal of this call is really to identify the factors that contributed to the outage and come up with action items. And this last step, and perhaps most important and most often overlooked step, is to follow up on those action items. So at Gremlin, we have an incident owner who is responsible for driving the resolution of the underlying causes in a timely manner. And one of the key phrases of that is in a timely manner. You see, I'm always asked, how do we prioritize unplanned reliability work when we got feature work to do? That's how we're measured. We got to get that out the door. I mean, it's simple. Operationally mature organizations prioritize the reliability of their services above all else. After all, what good is a new feature if it can't be used? So the way we handled this at Gremlin was to introduce the concept of DNR work. And what DNR means here is do not repeat. It's based on the thought that we should always be learning from our failures. Practically, what this means is all feature work is halted until the DNR work gets completed. In other words, you don't get to write new code until your old code gets fixed. What this does is incentivizes our engineers to consider resilience mechanisms up front. They end up writing code as if they're going to own and operate it indefinitely, instead of just churning out features to meet deadlines. At the end of the day, what an incident is is an opportunity to learn and to improve. And if you're not taking those lessons and incorporating them into your product, you're not learning. All right, that's plenty on the reactive side of the spectrum. Let's start to talk a little bit more about being proactive. Again, one of the questions I hear most often is, where should we start? And the answer again is probably easier than you think. Start experimenting with your system. Push it to its limits and validate your assumptions about how they'll behave under duress. Really go about flipping the paradigm from asking what did happen in the past tense and start asking what happens when. So proactively experimenting with our system means getting out ahead of problems, fixing them before they impact customers. And this is especially important these days, especially important these days with the evolution of everything being online on the internet. People use it to work, communicate, to live, 
nowadays. And with that evolution, customers have evolved a more stringent expectation for online services. They expect an unwavering, excellent experience 24-7, 365. And when they don't get it, they take to Twitter to make sure everyone knows about it. So failures become much more visible and they garner increased scrutiny from the public, which means that losses to companies during outages aren't just revenue-based anymore. They can affect brand. Of course, all of us would prefer to catch issues before they affect customers. That's a given. But where do you start? Well, we start by asking questions, stating hypotheses, and observing the outcomes. Anytime your hypothesis doesn't meet, match your outcome, you've uncovered a potential issue. You've also created an opportunity to fix it. So let's start with a couple questions and start with the softball. Ask yourself, what happens when resources are scarce? Most folks assume their systems scale up, but have you actually tested that it does? And what about when they're underutilized? Does your system scale back down? After all, you don't wanna pay for this unused capacity. And what about if we get a little bit more, more advanced? What happens when uh, containers attempt to exceed their resource limits? Can they exceed them? If so, you're not really containing anything. The whole point of containers is to keep that all bounded. Or what about when Kubernetes nodes run out of resources and can't allocate a pod? Do they fail gracefully and schedule the work for later? Or do they just bail out? And once you've built a solid and resilient infrastructure, you can turn your attention to your services and how they handle changes in state. See, in an increasingly ephemeral world, it becomes important to architect self-healing systems. So what happens when a process dies? Does your orchestrator replace it? Does it even know it went away? Or maybe it was even your orchestrator that killed it because it started to consume too many resources. At the same time, you need to can you need to approach the same question for VMs and hosts. Even though the scenarios are very similar, there are two distinct ways that they can fail, and they do. And then if you really want to dive deep, you can start to experiment with time travel. You can see how systems handle clock skew or whether or not you gracefully handle daylight savings time. Just a spoiler there, this one gets a lot of folks every year. And one of the most visceral demos I think I've seen was a Minecraft demo from one of our essays. He uh, ended up pushing the server back one hour and the server crashed with a very ugly Java stack exception. And now that we've validated all of our assumptions about our infrastructure and applications, it's time to turn your focus outward. So these days it's increasingly rare for applications to operate in isolation. And as such, it's very important for service owners to consider what failures could happen from their dependencies. This means asking yourself, what happens when the network fails and all traffic to a service starts getting dropped? Does your system fail over to a backup network or does it just start dropping requests? Maybe it tries to store those requests or tie them, retry them when the network becomes healthy again. And then what happens when the network does come back? Do you suddenly retry all of your requests, create a packet storm, brown out your downstream services? What happens, right? Or what about if the failure isn't quite as total? Instead, you just start to incur 250 milliseconds of latency on all your requests. Does your system handle this gracefully? Or do your requests start to back up until saturation reaches 100%? What about if there are 500 milliseconds? And then there are more interesting failures like dropping packets or losing connection to your DNS server. And frankly, I could go on and on. But I don't want to inundate you all with too much too quickly. The reason I'm asking all of these questions is because each one represents a unique way in which your system can fail. And as such, your service owners need to be proactively preparing to handle all of these situations. But it's not enough to validate a service against these scenarios once and then move on. Each of these behaviors should be cataloged and run continuously against the service to prevent any drift into failure as the system changes and evolves. You can think of it as building a library of scenarios to which your system has been immunized, growing that library with each lesson you learn. And these lessons should be shared across teams and service boundaries so that the whole organization learns together. So if you only take one thing away from this talk, it should be that to be operationally mature means not waiting for outages and incidents to happen to you or affect your customers but rather to go out and proactively root out the ways in which your system can and will fail before it has the chance to. So if you wanna learn more, you can go to gremlin.com slash CTO connection. 
And I thank you all very much for joining me today.